Hey, good morning, everybody. Let's get on our feet. Head in from the atrium. We've got some songs to sing this morning. Here we go. Welcome to Eagle Church. We're excited that we get to worship together this morning. Here we go. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rumble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. And this is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. And this is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. sin nobody but jesus who pulled me out of that pit and he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but jesus who rescued me from that Welcome, everybody, to Eagle Church. How are we today? That last song, we've done it, we've done it three weeks in a row now, and I, I just can't go on without telling you how much I enjoy getting to sing that song. I hope it's, I hope it's impacting you the way it is me personally, and I, I know the team. And it, it's particularly because of the, the bridge. I, I just got to go back to it for a minute. It says, who pulled me out of that pit? He did. Who paid for all of my sin? Nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave. And then we get to say that beautiful Yahweh, Yahweh. And who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but him. And and this morning, I just want to make sure that if if there's any sense of us right now that are struggling on on that thought, if we're struggling on where we need to put our hope in 
right now that, that you, you can commit some of the phrases from that song into memory. It's all over the radio right now. It's a Phil Wickham song, so just look it up on Amazon or whatever your, whatever your, um, your, your go-to music player is. And go to that when you might be in that mode of like, work sucks, this thing sucks, the weather sucks, all those things that are, that, that, like, I was excited for a yard work weekend and then weather happened and, and, and this transition I was excited for and then this happened. All those things and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm excited, I'm hopeful for this. When it lets you down, we come back every time that this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. And that's the hope that never ends up letting you down. He'll come through every time. And that's what we want to sing about this morning, okay? So as we go back into our worship, I just I want to pray the words of Psalm 115. This came up in a, in a, a Bible reading, and it, it also is the lyric to one of my favorite worship songs. But, but, but let's, let's just pray this into our next song. Uh, uh, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name. Give glory because of your faithful love and because of your truth. Right? So let's sing in the spirit of that. Amen. Save us. 
Lord, you are worthy of all our praise, all our glory, all the glory and the honor that we can bring to you. We lay it at your feet, Lord. Thank you for giving us uh, the gift of music and song so that we can exclaim um, how amazing you are. Lord, as we move into your word um, and engage with the teaching, Lord, I just pray that we do engage with that teaching, that we take it out into the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be a light into our world. Because you do bring that light into the darkness, and only you can. Lord, we love you. It is in your precious, glorious, and holy name that we pray together. Amen. Good morning, church. Um, I am Audrey Gilmore. I am our new middle school director here at Eagle. This is actually my second Sunday. Thank you. You guys are so sweet. Um, I am super thrilled to be here. I've already gotten to meet so many of your students, um, and they all just seem absolutely fantastic. Right, guys? You're fantastic? <laughs> yeah, Yay, one of them. Students. One of them's like, I am fantastic. Um, but I'm bringing the word today, um, our teaching text. So if you could open up with me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Church family, let's give Audrey another warm welcome to the Eagle family. So great having you here, Audrey. You can have a seat, everybody. So great having her here. She's two weeks on the job. If, if you're a student ministry family especially, I'd love it if you'd reach out to Audrey and have her over for dinner. I think her calendar's got plenty of open dates as she transitions into the Indianapolis area, but reach out, invite her, have her over, hang out. Middle school students have a great time upstairs with Audrey and Brad and the team. You ready for some good news this morning? Who needs good news this morning? I've got some really, really great news. After a 21-month search, but who's counting? After a 21-month search that took us coast to coast, it is a joy to announce to you we have a new worship director named John Solomon. Yay! How great is that? John and his wife, Whitney, of course, were here last weekend. Several of you met them. Thank you for hosting them so well. Solomon family, we love you. We're so excited to have you on this side of the screen uh, eventually in the coming weeks. They are worshiping and serving right now at Mosaic Church in a suburb of Las Vegas called Henderson, Nevada. And you remember a few months ago, I told my little journey with Vegas story, right? That's been a little personal challenge for me. I said in that message, do you remember? I believe God was at work and there are places of redemptive things happening in Vegas. I just didn't experience any of them. But the Solomon family in Mosaic Church is such a window of light in the midst of a really challenging setting. And so they've been there for almost four years there. And previously, John served at a church in that same area for 10 years. So he's got 14 years of ministry in that Las Vegas area. And Whitney was born and raised and grew up there. Uh, so this is a big move, right, for their family. And we're looking forward to welcoming them. Timing-wise, still working out some details Initial plan is he will be serving out there at Mosaic through May 21, and then we'll need some time, obviously, to move and transition and settle in here. But in the coming weeks, in the not-too-distant future, won't it be great, church family, to welcome uh, John and Whitney and their kiddos? So they wanted to share a greeting with you. Good morning, Eagle family. We are the Solomons. I'm John. I'm Whitney. I'm Braden. I'm Colton. We are so grateful that God has called us to worship with Eagle Church and to become a part of the Eagle Church family. We were so, so overwhelmed by the care, compassion, the love, the prayer that was a part of this process. And we just want to say thank you so much for being so kind and so welcoming to us. And we cannot wait to get out there so we can worship with you, so we can raise our family with you and grow in, in richness in the Lord together. So thank you so much for everything, and we cannot wait to worship with you. 
God bless you. See you soon. Everybody smile. <laughs> <laughs> So one of my favorite stories from their visit last weekend was Ted and I were taking John and Whitney around. It was Whitney's first time in the state of Indiana in her life. And so if you remember, like last Friday, Saturday, there were like two really glorious days in Indiana. Do you remember that? Like, okay. So they were glorious, and we were kind of trying to help them understand. They're not always like this kind of a thing, but we were driving through Zionsville, and we're just taking a little driving tour, and Whitney just says quietly in the car, she says, Guys, what are those beautiful yellow flowers all over the grass? <laughs> and she was sincere. She's like, they're just so beautiful. And Ted goes, they're weeds. <laughs> they're weeds. And she says, you're not going to kill them, are you? And we're like, 100%, we're killing all of them. <laughs> but isn't it, it's just such perspective, right? She's looking at some, a dandelion that we look at. It's just the weed it has got to go. And she's like... They're so beautiful. And then she would point out another, like there was like some purplish flowers in another part. And she goes, are those weeds too or flowers? Because they're beautiful too. Oh, but it was just a great weekend. Thanks for everyone who was a part of the process from staff to elders to worship team, tech team, everybody who was involved. You were super helpful. And it was just such a strong unity of spirit and oneness of heart that this was God's person and God's family for this moment in the life of Eagle Church. Couldn't be more excited and for the chapters ahead. Amen? Open up your Bibles if you haven't already done so. 2 Timothy chapter 1. That's where we're in. We started a, a series um, kind of in this journey with the life of the Apostle Paul. We're putting kind of a period at the end of what's been a year plus long series on Paul's life, and we've come to his final letter. We've come to his final words. We've come to his final days. It's around 67 AD. He's been arrested, re-arrested, placed in a dungeon-like prison in Rome. Nero is the emperor. Nero is coming for Paul. He's literally coming for Paul's head. In less than a year, Paul will be executed at Nero's command via beheading. And Paul knows this. He knows his days are numbered. And so he sits down his final days, writing his final words, his final letter, a book called Second Timothy, because he's passing the baton of leadership to a young man that's been working alongside him for about 15 years. So we started this conversation, first seven verses, this is where we're at. We're going to be in this letter for the next several weeks, so just kind of settle in. If you want to do your own little personal reading through Second Timothy, I commend it to you. It's not an overly long book. It won't take you long, but we're going to take our time and work our way through section by section, because I think Paul's final words carry a, an increasing weightiness to them. We started the conversation this way, looking at the first seven verses, and I asked the question, what was it developmentally about Timothy that gave Paul such confidence that the baton was being passed to the right person? I think that's an important question, right? That he's not just passing it to anyone. He's been walking alongside a young man whom he sees. I've, I said in these first seven verses, he points to four things that I outlined his, as Timothy's interior scaffolding. I want you to think of that as like his, the infrastructure of the inmost place of Timothy's life. What was the makeup, the beams of that interior world? That gave Paul confidence to know that when he's entrusted with a weight of leadership responsibilities, the scaffolding will hold. Because you know, leadership comes with a weight, right? And if you don't have the substance in here to uphold the external weight and responsibilities out there, do I need to provide commentary on what that looks like? That's kind of every Tuesday on our newsfeed, okay? It's implode is only a matter of when, no longer a question of if, and how much even more critical in Jesus' church and in Jesus' mission, and only 30 plus years removed from Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, how much do you think is at stake here to make sure that the leadership that's in place can handle what they're coming up against and can carry on the mission and the ministry they've been commissioned to? There's a lot on the line here. And there's four things, as I started into last week, we covered two last week, spiritual heritage, spiritual friendship. Those were the last week, and today we're going to cover the next two, which is spiritual gifts and alignment with the Spirit of God. So those are the four, what I would call, beams that Paul points to in these seven verses that make up Timothy's interior scaffolding. So spiritual gifts, verse 6, 
uh, that Audrey read for us. For this reason, Paul says to Timothy, I remind you, he's speaking to Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So a couple phrases I put in your notes there, right? Fan into flames is, it means to kindle, to stir up into a fire. So that's what it means to fan it, to stoke it, stir it up. And then the gift, the word gift, is actually comes from the word charisma. And it has this idea of a divine empowerment to get done what God has assigned you to get done. So God doesn't just ask you to do something. I think it was Augustine who said, God, demand whatever you wish, but God, provide for whatever you demand. That was Augustine. That's what's going on here. He's going to ask Timothy to step into some significant places of leadership, but he's empowering, he's giving him charisma, a divine enablement to do what he's been asked to do. You tracking with me? And so 1 Timothy 4, the previous letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, he outlined, he reminded Timothy that the elders got around you and the elders placed their hands on you just like Paul had done. And in that praying and placing on of hands, the scripture says in 1 Timothy 4 that God imparted to Timothy a spiritual gift, a charisma. Now, we're not given a lot of details about what that might be. I think it's fairly, it's pretty safe to speculate there, there had to be something in this arena of empowerment in Timothy's life in the pastoring, shepherding, teaching, and leading because of what he's going to be thrust into. So there's something here that's like, hey, is imparted to him something beyond Timothy's own personal skills and abilities, a supernatural, a spiritual of God gift, an impartation from God through the laying on of the hands of the elders and Paul. And so he's reminding him, I want you to see, church, There's a difference between the impartation and then notice the exhortation to fan it into flame. So it's the impartation of the gift, and then there's the exhortation to develop what you've been given. As one writer put it, the gifts don't come to us in full bloom. They must be cultivated and exercised over time. And so you remember last week, if you were here last week, I shared about a person in my life who was greatly impactful named Pastor Andy Winters. He was a youth pastor, Community Heights Alliance Church, Newton, Iowa. I was 16 years old when I first met Pastor Andy. And I was new to the whole church scene. I, Jesus was like fourth on the list. It was blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful Kendra. I wanted to be wherever she was. You know, G, Jesus will use whatever he's got to do to get right. And, he, and I was just, hey. And her mom said, if you want to hang out with Kendra, you got to hang out at the church. I'm like, I'm in. I'm at church. So I'm hanging out at church. And the youth pastor says to me, I started hanging around the youth group a little bit, and he says, hey, every spring we do like this, the, you remember those days when the youth group like led the adult service with like a skit that the whole youth group would put on? Like they did a drama, like a 10, 15 minute kind of like play or skit that all the youth group would do together. And Pastor Andy says to me, he says, hey, Eric, I'd like you to be a part of this skit. Now remember, I'm new to this whole thing. I got no idea what's going on. I said, uh, okay. I was my first experience with being voluntold, right? You ever? Okay, in church world, you're going to get really good to use voluntold, right? And so he says, and I picked the part for you. I said, really? He said, yeah, I want you to be the pastor. I'm 16 years old. And he, I said, oh, okay. And then like the other youth group guys were around, yeah, 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 Eric, you're the pastor, perfect. You know, everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, Okay, so he gave me my lines, and you know, a couple weeks later, there I am on a Sunday night at Community Heights Alliance Church with the adult congregation gathered. I step behind a massively large wooden pulpit, and I read memorized lines, pretend preaching at 16 years old. I graduate, go off to Iowa State, And when I step onto campus at Iowa State, another man I mentioned last week, Scott Ely, he's a campus leader at a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. It's now called Crew, Crew Campus Leader. And Scott Ely steps into my life and he says, Eric, I want you to help me lead a Bible study on your floor, on your dorm floor. I said, okay. So I started leading a Bible study with him. And he said, hey, Eric, prime time, Thursday night meeting. We've got a big hub meeting, a couple hundred students. I want you to like, you know, start... You know, like maybe doing the welcome, and we're going to do some kind of upfront games and stuff. I want you to be one of the upfront folks who do some of that. Okay. And then a couple years went along that way, and then it was like, hey, we got this like devotional time, and we want to have all the student leaders together, and we want you to share a few words about your story and testimony with the whole group. Okay. 
And so we just kind of, right, kept, kept taking steps. I graduated from Iowa State. I came to Indianapolis to work for Eli Lilly and Company. I became a marketing systems analyst at Lilly, loved what I was doing there, loved the people I was with. They were paying me way too much money, way too early in my career to do what I was doing. It was Prozac glory years, Lilly. You remember those Prozac glory years? I remember showing up at my first meeting at Lilly, and there was this massive spread of food in the center of the table. I said, what in the world is this? And they said, oh, all the group meetings have this food in it. And I go, oh, this is heaven on earth right here. I show up at Lily and I need a church home. I meet Pastor Kerry Bowman. He's planting Eagle Alliance Church on the west side of Indianapolis. I said, that's interesting. I'm going to find out what Kerry's up to. I'm going to show up at his meeting and I meet Kerry and we start hanging out a little bit. And Kerry says to me, hey, you're single, right, Eric? I said, yeah, I'm single. He says, we need a singles ministry. You're it. Ball and told. See, I told you. You want to do that? I said, that sounds like, okay. So we started to Singles ministry, started getting them together, and then about a year later, Kendra and I got married. Yes, the same Kendra who, you know, right into the church scene. Yes, her, and we get married, and Carrie says to Kendra and I, hey, you're a young couple, like a young married now. We need like a young married's ministry. You're it. <laughs> Catching the theme here, aren't you? And the church plant, you know, church plant life. You're doing whatever you need to do. You're right, sweeping floors and scrubbing toilets and printing bulletins and helping the church get going. And several of you were around during those days. And um, I remember Kerry said to me a couple of years into that, he's like, hey, you know, Sunday morning, like I need someone to kind of like maybe do the welcome and announcements and maybe read a scripture every now and then. Just help transition, kind of host the service. Would you just kind of be a host? Okay. And then, you know, he says, hey, I think Wednesday night we're going to do like a discipleship class, and I think you could be really helpful if you could like help some others learn how to share their faith. Would you like put together a discipleship class and teach some adults like do that? Okay. (laughs) And all along the way, there were men like Jerry Mabstone and Fred Polding and John Rich and Steve Swinney and David Mays, and others I could keep going. And periodically, they'd place their hands on my shoulders, and they'd pray. And they'd ask God's blessing, and they'd speak words into me. They'd speak words about, we see some things in you that you might not be able to see in yourself. We think God might have entrusted you with some things in some teaching and communication gifts, and we want to pray and bless and support and encourage and mentor and guide. And we just kind of kept taking steps, steps, steps. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can make the Christian life way too complicated. Like I can get like, I can just overcomplicate it. And I've often thought the Bible word righteousness, like what does it mean to live in righteousness? I just kind of, my simple way of approaching it would be, just do the next right thing that Jesus puts in front of you to do with his help and strength. Just do that. And then when you do that, do the next right thing that Jesus puts in front of you to do with his help and strength. I think that's what the Bible's referring to when, he, when he's saying calling us to live a life of righteousness honoring him. And I can remember the early days when Carrie first said to me, I think it's time for you to actually put together a Sunday morning message from the Bible and actually open it and teach and talk about it. I started seminary up at Trinity. I'd left Lily at this time, and I said, okay. And he was very smart. Kerry was so smart at so many things. And he said, you know what? I'm going to give you Memorial Day weekend. (laughs) Come on now. You with me? Like, we were down at West 71st Street at the time, and Memorial Day, West 71st Street in the 90s, Like, no one came to church. You couldn't get to church very easily. It was the faithful few, like, really faithful few. He's like, I want you to preach on Memorial Day because the people who are coming, they're just so gracious and so kind. You literally can't train wreck that thing. Like, they're going to support you and love you, and they're going to be just so patient with you. You can't mess that one up. He's so smart. So I think my first Sunday was a Memorial Day weekend. I think the title was Racing for a Winning Life rough. Oh. Some of you are here and still following Jesus. Thank you so much for enduring those early years. You were so kind and so gracious. And then Carrie gave me like a 4th of July weekend. That was another like, you know, 
can't mess that one up too bad. And then it was like the Sunday after Christmas. That's another one, like lots of people got, can't mess. But you see, just you, so many of you here have been so much a part of just my humble attempts at trying to fan into flame for the last 30 years, I have tried, certainly not perfectly, plenty of mistakes, but I've tried to steward and develop and grow into gifts that God had entrusted to me. This is, what the, this is the journey of the Christian life. This is like, just do the next right thing Jesus puts in front of you to do with his help and strength and do that. And it might be a little voluntold once in a while. That's okay, you know, it's okay. Just maybe say a little more quickly, okay to something that maybe someone sees something in you that you're not able to see in yourself, and maybe they place their hand on a shoulder, and they pray a blessing over you, and the Spirit imparts something to you, and they're speaking words of life into you, and your role is just to you know, come alongside with the Holy Spirit's help and just grow and develop and work at it. Are you with me, church? Is this making sense? So I wrote some questions down here. I left in your notes, questions that I ask you as I ask myself this way. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Do you know what they are? If you don't, that'd be a great first step. There's a ton of great resources on the web. You can just go, tons of free like online spiritual gifts assessments, and you can go there and give you a little overview and reach out to Pastor Ted. He's got some great resources on this. He taught a class on this last year. But understand what your spiritual gifts are. And then second question, are you fanning into flame those gifts that you think you might have been entrusted with? Are you working and developing and growing into those things? Could you imagine what it would look like as a church family if we had several hundred of us fanning into flame the gift God's given us? Could you imagine? That would be crazy. Now listen, there's a lot of you that are doing that. Praise God. The church is only operating based on those of you who are fanning into flame what he's entrusted you and given to you. But there's, can you imagine if that was just rippled out several hundred more? What would it look like? Here, here's, I thought about this this week. I thought, you know, here's what would happen. Kim Shepson and Children's Ministry would have to put you on a wait list. Brad and Audrey and Student Ministry, you'd be on their wait list. You're like, I want to serve and help in students or children. You'd be I appreciate that. Love having you. Get some clarity about where you feel like you'd fit best. Put you on the wait list. We'll get in touch with you. Worship team, band, vocalist, tech team. Hey, I want to jump, I want to jump in. I want to be a part of what's going on in the worship ministry. Well, I'll put you on the wait list. Missions team, I thought Lacey with the missions group, wouldn't it be amazing that people are excited about serving refugees and blessing the nations and taking care of the least of these? You call up Lacey and say, I'm excited to get involved. I got you on the wait list. We'll get back in touch with you. Can you imagine? That's what it would be like. There'd be so many people who were fanning into flame and trying to steward and grow and develop that we wouldn't have enough places, enough outlets for it. We'd have to continue to push out that way. I think that's supposed to be normal Christian life. It's Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, I see something in you that you don't see in and of yourself. I'm going to place a hand on his shoulder. The Spirit of God's going to impart, and now I'm going to commission you, develop it, grow it, mature it, work at it. There's so much at stake here. This is what I mean by the spiritual heritage combined with spiritual friendships aligned with spiritual gifts. Do you see the scaffolding going on inside of this young man? Paul sees it, and he feels confident about handing the baton based on that scaffolding. I promise you, we'll get to this in a minute, I promise you Timothy's response to receiving that baton, he'll be like, uh, uh, he's feeling like, uh, yeah, that's when you know you're in the, pretty much the right spot. <laughs> when you know you feel the, the weight of that baton coming your way, you're like, yeah. And that's what this fourth and final area we'll look at from these seven verses. I called it alignment with the Spirit of God. Follow this now in verse seven. He falls right on the heels of fan into flame. He says this, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So it's been 15 years since Paul first met Timothy in his hometown of Lystra, which is modern-day Turkey. And when Paul met Timothy, remember we already covered it, that Timothy had grown up in a household. Remember his mother Eunice we talked about last week? It was in Acts 16, it says his mother was a Jewish Christian and his father was Greek. So that was the household he was raised in. And so Eunice had built some things early on in Timothy's life that when Paul steps in, he sees some things developing in this young man. Now, Timothy's probably late teens, early 20s when Paul meets him. And so it, it's this 
He's youthful, he's young, but he's got a strong and solid foundation. And so Paul says, you know what? Why don't you start hanging out with me? Here's a good image for like discipleship. You just start hanging out with me and we'll start doing ministry together. And Paul just starts bringing him along his missionary journeys that we covered the past year. Many times Timothy was with Paul when he went to Macedonia, when he went to Corinth, when he went to Asia Minor. Timothy was with him. And he got to see a lot as we covered, right? He got to see Paul at, in some amazing moments and some really hard moments and all the ordinary in between. Well, Paul, when he gets to Ephesus, which we spent a good chunk of time in Ephesians talking about the cultural realities in Ephesus, that there was so much to be undone from the cultural impact on the people of Ephesus, like Artemis and the, the things that had been, the ways of Artemis and the, the temple of Artemis and the domineering presence of the culture of that day had so worked its way into the fabric of people's worldview that Paul knew this is going to be a really difficult turnaround. We're going to get the flag of the gospel planted here, but it's going to require years of intentional teaching, mentoring, praying, building, appointing. Guess who he puts there? Timothy. He says, Timothy, Ephesus, go. It's you. Man. Talk about a training ground. So it's Timothy who steps into Ephesus, who's going to help these young believers, this early church, get the gospel planted there, unlearn the ways of Artemis, and integrate into the new way of Jesus. Which I think, again, when I look at 2023 North America, I think we're more Ephesian than we realize from a cultural standpoint. And so perhaps now more than ever, it's a moment for Timothys that are needed to step in for spiritual leadership. I like how John Stott Put it. He's a scholar who wrote this. He said, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus as a kind of embryonic bishop. Wide responsibilities were given to him to combat, listen to this, combat heretics who were troubling the church there, to order the church's worship, to select and ordain its elders, to structure the relief ministry of its widows, to command and teach the apostolic faith together with the moral duties that flow from it. Do you think Timothy had a little bit to do? Do you see like Paul, but Paul was confident that he saw some things inside this interior world of Timothy. He said, you can handle this. Absolutely, it's going to stretch you, but this is right where God wants you. It's weighty responsibilities to a young man who's the Bible, the scripture says this about Timothy, he's young, he's weak, and he's shy. That's what the Bible says about him, young, weak, and shy. I put it in your notes. See the scriptures there? 1 Timothy 4.12. Here's where Paul says you're young. Don't, look, don't let anyone look down on you, Timothy, because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and purity. Like I said, right now, when he's writing First and Second Timothy, Timothy's now 15 years later, so he's probably late 20s, early 30s is probably where he's at in his journey when he's receiving the baton. And he's weak. Look at 1 Timothy 5, 23. Stop drinking only water. Use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. So Timothy's body was struggling. He had digestive issues, stomach issues. And so it was a, he just felt weak a lot physically. He just, his body was a challenge. Some of you here know all about this. You're so passionate to serve Jesus and your body just doesn't hold up very well. You're Timothy. That's Timothy. That's where he was at. So he was young. He was weak physically. And then look, he's shy. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul writes to the church at Corinth about Timothy. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear because he knows Timothy's prone to fear. He's prone to get scared while he's with you for he's carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. There's a theme when Paul writes about Timothy to the various churches and the theme is Timothy has a timid temperament. In the Myers-Briggs study, if he, if he did like a Myers-Briggs, he's a strong I, super introverted. And so he tended to kind of shrink back from challenge stuff. He was a bit shy, and he would get scared. He'd struggle with fear. This is Timothy. Like, I felt like his childhood nickname might have been on the playground. Hey, Timid Timothy. Hey, Timid Timothy, come on over here. So young, weak, shy, God says, got my man. Right there. You know, it's draft week this week in the NFL. All you football fans, draft week, you've been waiting a while, right? And no, I don't have any inside information on what in the world we're going to do to draft, drafting a quarterback, right? But, but 
At the Colts facility, there's a draft room. They call it a war room. That's some of the language they use. This massive room with all these whiteboards, magnetic boards. And there are these little magnetic, like, small pieces like this that are like magnet that have, that have different players written on them. Name, school they went to, height, weight, position. They have these, like, magnetic strips everywhere of all these. The room just filled with all these. And then they've got them moving all around the board. And I thought about, you know... The Bible says that God's got his own draft room. He's got his own war room. He's got his own magnetic strips. Do you know what the qualities are on those magnetic strips? They're like this. Least likely, ordinary, not sure, <laughs> timid, weak, overlooked, forgotten, marginalized. Like, God's got a draft board. Now listen, it's not to say he can't use anyone that comes to the table with a little bit more like strength, like Samson. Like there's an occasional story through the Bible where God does use someone who brings an awful lot, humanly speaking, to the table. But you have to agree with me, when you read the Bible, the general pattern in the scripture is God uses the ordinaries, the least likelies, the, the Timothys, and the Davids. Do you remember David? David was a family run. He was eighth in the line. Like he wasn't even invited to the party. He says, okay, David, next king of Israel, second king of Israel. Saul was the people's choice. A whole lot of commentary we could make on that, right? The general picture in the Bible as well is the collective voice of the people isn't always wisdom. We probably need a little bit of help in that these days. But there's wisdom often spoken in the Bible in small little places, like the voice of the prophet who's a voice calling in the wilderness. God says, there's the voice of wisdom, but you got the whole culture clamoring this way. That's not wisdom. I think that might be a bit us these days. And so you got David. He's not even invited to the party. He says, yeah, I pick him. Saul was God's choice. Saul was the people's choice. David's my choice. He wasn't even invited to the party, family run, taking care of the sheep out in the pasture, and probably comes to the party smelling like, you know, the outside, manure and everything else. Yep, there's my man. Gideon. He takes Gideon. Remember last week? What did it say of Gideon in Judges 6? God says, hey, mighty war here. And Gideon's like, yeah, you got the wrong address. And he says, I'm from the weakest of all the people. My family is the least in the clan. Weakest and least. Draft board. That's God's draft board right there, right? Family runt, weakest and least. How about Peter? Peter in the New Testament, he denies Jesus three times, running out. It's getting pressure packed. He needs, Jesus to, he needs Peter to step forward. Peter runs away. Not once, twice, three times. Peter, there you go. You're going to be a spiritual leader in the church. Huh? Thomas, how about doubting Thomas, the guy who says, I'm not jumping on the Jesus train with his resurrection thing until I see the hands and the feet and the scars myself. Saul of Tarsus arrests Christians, persecutes followers of Jesus. Yep, there's my man. And then timid Timothy. Are you following me? Are you tracking with me here? Here's the general pattern with God. When he's going to his draft board to select what he's going to get done in the world, he's like, here's what I've got. I'm going to look for the least likely, the ordinary, the often overlooked, the shy, and the timid. That's who I'm looking for. And you say, well, why, why would God do that? Why is it that way? Well, Paul writes about this to the church at Corinth. Here's a couple of sentences he gives us. It gives you a little window into the why. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29, he says to the church at Corinth, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose, follow this, the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Here's the so that. So that no one may boast before him. Well, here's my translation of that paragraph. I wrote this. God chooses the least likely to accomplish his purposes because it's most likely the attention and focus and credit will go Godward. Do you follow that? He chooses the least likely because it's most likely that the attention and focus is going to go Godward when he gets done what he wants to get done in this world. 
So another way to say it is God's going to arrange the way he gets his mission and ministry done in this world. He's going to arrange the ingredients in such a way that people are going to look upon it and say, that had to be God. That's the point. Does that make sense? So if you're here and you feel like super underqualified and slightly overwhelmed or maybe major league overwhelmed, we might say it this way today. You feel out over your skis. You're in God's draft board. Perfect. I'm looking for everyone who feels like they're out over their skis, God says, who feels completely overwhelmed, wondering, for sure, you're sure I'm feeling shy about this. I'm feeling pretty timid about this. I, I'm pretty weak in this area. God, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And God's like, yeah, this is why. Now, church, do you understand why Paul then has to say to Timothy, Timothy, I understand you've got a back. You're young. I understand you struggle physically. I understand your temperament is pretty timid and shy. But here's what I want to remind you of, verse 7. He says, God didn't give you a spirit of timidity. I know they call you timid, Timothy. I'm going to rename you right now. He says, God says, I'll give you a spirit of power. Notice these three, power, love, self-discipline. So here's what Paul put on on the table for him. Power, these three words I put in your notes. Dunamis, it's a strength that comes from God's resources. How good do you think that strength will be? God says, from my resources, I will strengthen you. I'll give you dunamis. And he actually says of himself later in 2 Corinthians, that's when Paul said he experienced God's dunamis strength the most is in his place of weakness. For whatever Paul was struggling with physically, which Timothy would have been very familiar with, we're not told what it was with Paul, but it was something with his body that he begged God to heal. And God said, you know what? Going to keep it right there because in that place of weakness, you're going to see my power strength. So Timothy, your digestive issues, you're going to see power and strength of God in that. Hmm. How about love? He says, love, agape is the word, and it's to will the good of another, to esteem someone. And then self-discipline, it's the word sophronimus. It means self-control, prudence, sound reasoning. Follow me here. Can you, this is the kind of leadership God's looking for. Think about this. It's a kind of leadership, and it's not just like in the church, but across all of culture. He's looking for men and women who will lead in this way, who will operate their authority and leadership for the good of others, leaning into the strength and resources that God provides, and and doing it with sound reasoning and clear thinking and prudence. That's what he's looking for. Can you imagine how differently our world would be if we had more men and women stepping into leadership roles and authority positions operating with that? With dunamis and agape and sophronimus. Can you imagine what it would be like? <laughs> Not just in the church. I'm talking about all, across all spheres. Business, in the arts, sports, politics, all of it. Entertainment industry, all of it. And the church for sure. Could you, what would it be like to just have men and women rising up and leading from a place for the good of others, from a base of relying on God's strength with sound reasoning, wisdom, and judgment? Oh my gosh, you know what I think it would be? I think it would be an answer to Jesus' prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Remember Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What's the next line? On earth as it is in heaven. So it's got, Jesus is praying, hey, Lord, would you make up there come down here? Do you know how up there up there's going to come down here? The way things are running up there in heaven, we'd like it to run down here a little bit more like it runs up there. Anybody ready for that? I'd love for things to run down here a little more like they run up there. And God says, yeah, here's my plan for doing it. I'm going to pick the least likely the most ordinary, the most unqualified. I'm going to fill them with my spirit. I'm going to commission them to do my work. I'm going to empower them to step forward and handle their authority this way for the will, the will, the good of others, relying on God's strength with sound reasoning and judgment. And then you know what's going to happen? As men and women step into that and they lead and rule in righteousness, up there comes down here. That's how it's supposed to be, church. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? Man, and it's happening. It's happening. You got to look for it, but it's happening. God's doing it. He's raising it up. But perhaps now more than ever, we need what Paul's commissioning Timothy for. I love what Dallas Willard says about this. God's intent for us, hear this, 
is that we would become the kind of persons that he can empower to do what we want. Now stop right there. That's important. To become the kind of person that you can do what you want. How many feeling good about that? Depends which hour, which day, right? But here's what he said. Look, follow this. Like a parent handing the keys over to a 16-year-old son or daughter. Clearly, Willard says, this means our wanter needs to change. The more we have the character of Christ, the safer it is for us to receive God's power. So Paul, Paul looks at a young man, Timothy. He looks at his heart. He looks at his character, and he says, I see a young man that's got formation and development inside here. He's ready to receive the weightiness of this baton. Church, isn't that a vision for disciple-making for us as a body? I can't think of a better vision for a home as parents and for a congregation as a church. Like, we are the Loises and Eunices of today raising up the Timothys of tomorrow. That's what we're commissioned to do. We're to band together and to guide and to pray and to counsel and empower and equip and develop fan into flame the gifts God imparts and entrusts by the Holy Spirit to a generation that's coming up. And then the generation that's coming up, we need to release them to step into places of leadership, having been equipped, having been empowered, having been developed, having been discipled. They're released then to a place like Timothy. Paul looks and says, we want to see a generation of leaders with an interior scaffolding to uphold the weight of what's going to be entrusted to them. How do you know it's their spiritual heritage, spiritual friendships, spiritual gifts, and alignment with the Spirit of God? And when that happens, up there is coming down here. What a day. Anybody ready for that day? I mean, I know we got a lot of things going on. Everybody's super busy, lots going on, work, family, life, stuff, school, kids, students, school. I would, just, I would just challenge us to think, is there anything more important than that kind of work that we put our hands to that plow? What's going to matter 100 years from now? That. That. And I believe right now in 2023, we are at that tip of the spear moment for the local church in North America at this time. We need... The Loises and Eunices, we got to step forward with a degree of sacrifice and intentionality to step into the lives of the Timothys and say, let's go. There's too much at stake. There's too much on the line. It matters that much. And it's going to take all of us, every single one of us, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, students, going to take all of us. Hey, you got to have a whole bunch of Loises and Eunices. Students, we need Timothys too. you got to have availability of the next generation. And I, th- I see it happening. I see a lot of young people raising up, asking for mentorship, asking for leadership, asking for direction. Praise God. Now it's Loises and Eunices. We step forward. And we step into like the Paul-like place. And we begin to commission and develop and empower through spiritual heritage spiritual friendship, spiritual gifts, and alignment with the Spirit of God. May it be so. Amen. Don't want to say up there, come down here. Worship team, come on back up. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for Paul. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you from a dungeon and a cell, chained, no doubt probably bloodied from his flogging. He writes such impactful words, bridging from 67 to 2023. That has to be the word of the Lord. And so right now, by your spirit, would you empower us, enable us, equip us to be the Loises and Eunices of today, raising up the Timothys of tomorrow. We need your help, Lord. We feel overwhelmed, at times very weak, perhaps wanting to shrink back. May we hear today, I've not given you a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Grant it to us by the Holy Spirit. Make it so. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is is in heaven. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We're going to wrap up with one final song. As we do, we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings. Details are up here on the screen, how you can give electronically. There's some boxes in the back if you want to give your physical gifts that way. Thank you so much for your generosity. Continue to steward. That's what we're putting the resources to, this very vision of raising up a generation and building and multiplying leaders, all this stuff. And it takes resources to get it done. 
And so thank you for helping us do that together. Let's stand together. Team's going to lead us one final song, and then we're going to hear from Kim, our children's director.
excited to invite you to this year's VBS, which is three nights, and it's June 26th through the 28th. It's 6 to 8.15 this year, and I'm inviting all of you guys because it takes a village to minister to our kids, and so last year we had 150 kids and 90 plus volunteers, which was amazing. So this year we'd love to have even more kids, so if you guys are here, we'd love for you to sign your kids up. They can invite their friends. It's free. They get a free t-shirt. For parents and volunteers, it is a just a great time with the kids. There's training, so you guys will know what to do in advance, and I would love for each of you to be in a position that you would really just enjoy. So we have behind the scenes opportunities, we have um, things with just you know ministering to our kids, we have games, we have activities. Um, I would love to have you involved wherever you would like to be. At the end of our VBS each night, we have our snacks on the lawn with some games, and on our last night we'll have a big bounce house. But if you can picture almost like 300 people just outside fellowshipping, mm -hmm. that's the picture of the church that we want for our community. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great time just to come to know people in our church body, but also to meet the people who are coming for the first time. So you can go to eaglechurch.com slash VBS, find out more information about sending your kids here, your neighbor kids too, and then also volunteering. And then a couple more announcements, and then see me if you have any questions about any of that. Um, we also have a child dedication coming up on May 21st, and this is an opportunity for parents to dedicate their children to the Lord, to commit to raise them, to follow the, mm -hmm. the Lord all the days of their lives. But it's also a chance for our body to commit to you, to encourage you, to be alongside you as you raise your kids to follow Jesus. And so you can also find that at eaglechurch.com slash events. We'd love to have you a part of it if you have not dedicated your children yet. And then my final announcement is that today after church, we're having our Eagle Kids Volunteer Appreciation Lunch. Sabrina Smiley is going to be speaking. I'm really excited for people to hear from her about engaging all of our kids. If you are a volunteer, even if you did not sign up yet, you are welcome to come. And one of the things that I want to do today, so I will say it to you guys, is we have 130 volunteers in our mm. Eagle Kids ministry. If you guys would like to join our team, it's amazing. Just the people who are involved, we'd love to have you. But of those 130, 40 of those are middle school and high school wow. kids. So if you could just give our middle school and high school volunteers a round of applause. They do an amazing job. Students. Thank you, Kim. Let's stand together. How great is Kim and the staff? Let's give a round of applause to everybody who invests downstairs, lower level work. Thank you so much to pour into those kiddos. We're so grateful for all that's going on in our kids and student world. 
Well, we're going to have a couple of other opportunities for you to connect with. Eagle 101 is a class happening May 21 right after church. So some of you are newer or maybe even around a while and you just want to get a little more connected. It's going to be a class. We're going to feed you. It's going to be a couple of hours right after service on May 21. That'll be a good first step into some things that way. And if you want to get connected to a small group, you can just send it uh, on eaglechurch.com slash events. There's a place you can click for small group information. Pastor Ted will get in touch with you that way. And if you're new, so great to have you here. If you're new online, your host will take care of you. Thanks for joining us that way. We've got a guest central kiosk out in the atrium, some gift bag and some free stuff. Stop there. We'll give you some stuff on the way out. I want to send you out today with a benediction from John 20. Uh, I was thinking about the period of time following Jesus' resurrection. The church, uh, fa- the church fathers call this Easter tide season, the time period from the resurrection to Pentecost Sunday. The 50 days is called Easter tide. That resurrection isn't the completion of something, but it's the inauguration of something. It's a great picture, like rippling out, tide pouring out. Well, during their post-resurrection encounter, the disciples in John 20, here's what it says. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were all together, and the, for, the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. So I want to pronounce a benediction around some places in your heart where you feel like are locked up. And I want you to think about what Jesus did here to them. They were locked up behind fear. You might be locked up behind fear. You might be locked up behind a bunch of other stuff. Here's what Jesus did. It says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Jesus walked through walls to get to their locked places. And so may the Jesus who is risen and reigning and ruling by the power of his spirit May he find those locked places in your heart, and may he walk through those walls to get to you. And may you hear him say today, peace be with you. My peace I give you. Go in his name. Amen.